Hi, Dr. Bob here to talk to you today about Exposure Basics. This is a talk that was originally given at our Fairview Hospital Photography Club in December 2009. It was later revised and given again in October 2012. In this tutorial, we really cover the components involved in creating a proper exposure so that it's neither too dark nor too light, but just right. Any good photograph has correct exposure. This will be similar to the beginning of an NFL football game in which they introduce the players to you. We'll go over what those players are that are involved in making a proper exposure, but keeping with the football analogy, we will not cover game plans or strategy, that sort of thing. We will cover a variety of topics in future lectures, including scene modes, including advanced exposure settings such as shutter priority and aperture priority shooting, and also deal with some metering and the advanced exposure and autofocus talk. So this is really just to introduce to you the basics involved with creating a proper exposure. What are the variables that can be controlled to give you a good exposure? This talk is broken into three parts. We've got some introductions and definitions where we'll introduce the concept of exposure and also talk about something called histograms. We will also then get into the major determinants of exposure. The three main controllable determinants are shutter speed or exposure time, aperture or what we call the f-number or f-stop, and the ISO setting. So that will be the bulk of this talk. And then finally we'll finish up talking about some advanced techniques for proper exposure and those will be covered in more detail in a subsequent talk. All right, so let's dive in. When we think of exposure, we think of the overall amount of light in a photograph. And let me ask you up front, which of these photographs do you think is a better photograph? Photo A or photo B? Well, obviously, both of these photos lack any contrast and convey essentially no meaningful information. The photo on the left could have been a one one thousandth of a second exposure taken at midnight, so it could be a real photograph, but all the pixels, every single picture element, a little dot, in that is totally black. It's as dark as dark can be. On the right side could be a 20 second exposure of a beach scene on a sunny day. To get a proper exposure we absolutely have to have some type of contrast between dark and light because these two photos are worthless. So what is photographic exposure? Well it refers to the amount of light reflected off a subject or off an area of a photographic scene onto the camera's film, or now in the digital era, onto the camera's image sensor. So if we look at this little schematic here, taking a photograph of a flower, the image uh, is inscribed on the sensor in the back, and hopefully will then produce this finished photo that you see right here. A proper exposure has good light and dark contrast and balance to it. Now the exposure content of an individual photograph can be displayed as a histogram, and we will speak about these in a little bit more detail momentarily. The histogram for this particular photograph looks like this, where on the left end you have the black in the background, that's the dark areas, and then the flower made of yellow and white is the little peak there in the center toward the right end. Let's take a look at some photos. I'm going to start with this one here and ask you what is that? It's pretty dark and it kind of looks like the outline silhouette of a castle perhaps. I'm going to give you a little bit more exposure as we go across here. And what you will see is that this is a clock tower. This is the clock tower in downtown Hudson, Ohio. And these are just black and white images that showing you different degrees of exposure as we go along here. So that's a series of nine images, the first three of which are clearly underexposed. The ones in the middle, probably number six there, is likely my best shot in terms of overall exposure. And then the three on the right, especially the last two, are certainly overexposed. So we go from too dark to OK to too light. Now virtually all modern cameras now have automatic modes to assist you with the proper exposure. Cameras have light meters and then pick certain settings on the camera to hopefully give you a good exposure. If you shoot in programmed mode or in automatic mode, that's what you're going to get. Now you may have manual settings on your camera to allow for more customization. And in certain situations, those are even preferable because the camera can be fooled. 
Most digital cameras also display histograms to confirm proper exposure. Well, what is a histogram? Well, a histogram is simply a graph of frequency distribution. And I don't want to get too technical here, but I'm in the medical field, so let me just show a histogram out of a medical journal. This is the International Journal of Obesity. And this was a population of Middle Eastern women, actually, where they took 600 women and just measured their body mass index, where a good body mass index is, oh, 23 to 25, 26. Uh, you'll see that close to 100 of the women had a body mass index between 24 and 26. So those were good. But we have quite a gradation across the uh, graph here. We have some uh, histogram bars showing women on the left hand, which have very low body mass index. They were the very thin women. And then up on the other end, shown in the orange arrow, we have those that were rather hefty and obese. Obesity is typically over 30 BMI. So this is a graph showing the distribution out of those 600 women of where they stand in terms of BMI. How does this relate to photography? Well, each photograph that we look at can also be displayed as a histogram. On the left end, instead of those being uh, light in weight, this is those that are shy in terms of overall light. So the dark end of the spectrum here, we've got the purple arrow in the shadows. On the other end of the spectrum, where the pixels are bright, we call those the highlight zones. And then in between, obviously, the midtones. So let's take a look at this series of photos that we've already looked at and how they would produce histograms. This one in the center has a histogram with a peak on the left and then another peak on the right. The peak on the left is the dark area. That would be the clock and the trees there. The peak on the right end, that would be the white sky, which is pretty bright. Now, the good news with this histogram is that we don't really seem to go off either end of the spectrum. And that's really what we want with histograms. If you do a quick look at your histogram and you've gone off either end of the spectrum, then you've lost detail in your photograph. For example, this very first one that's quite underexposed, we don't even make it over to halfway across the histogram with any pixels, but we go off the end as shown by that red arrow. That's on the dark side, so we've got no detail in the dark sections of that photograph. In contrast, the far right photograph, which is clearly overexposed, shows that we go off the high end there. We've lost all detail in the sky, it's just as bright as bright can be. This is the point where you'll also see what is affectionately referred to as the blinkies on your LCD screen sometimes where the overexposed area of the photograph flashes at you. That is the camera's way of telling you that you've lost detail in this area and that you're very overexposed in this particular portion of the photograph. So ideally, we want a histogram that isn't cut off on either end of the spectrum. And then you'll at least have an image to work with. You can tweak it later on with editing software. Now, there is an exception to this rule. And that's if you're shooting a shot where you don't care about detail on one end of the spectrum. And a classic example might be shooting fireworks. This is a shot I took a few years ago. And the sky was black, black, but that's what I want. I don't want any detail in the sky. I want it to be as dark as possible. And the histogram produced here obviously goes off the left end on the darks. But since I didn't need any detail in that, uh, this image still is good. So that's an exception to the no cutoff rule. All right, well, let's think about the determinants of exposure. And to do that, I went to my friend Doug's house. He lives a couple of miles away from me in this home, which uh, at least parts of it were built 160 some years ago. And one thing you'll notice about his house is that he has real shutters, not just decorative shutters, but real shutters that you can fold over the window and close down to protect the window. So I went to Doug's house and took a few photographs. Here's one of one of his windows with the shutters closed. Now suppose I started like this and then opened up the shutters only to find Doug there looking at me with sunglasses on. And then after a short time period, close down the shutters again. My question for you is what factors would determine the total amount of light to reach Doug's eyes?
And just think about things that could do that because this will correlate with what happens in a camera. I mean, obviously, the amount of time that I keep that shutter open is important. Maybe how big the window is, how strong the sunglasses are, how far from the screen he is. You could think of a variety of factors that could come into play determining how much total light gets to his eyes. We'll come back to this construct at the very end of the talk and try to give you some perspective on it. All right, so what are the major determinants of exposure? Well, there are a few that you can't control very easily. So let's just touch on those first. Uh, obviously, the amount of available light is going to be a major factor of your exposure for any photograph. Uh, if it's really low light, you may need to introduce light with a strobe or a flash, but that's not the focus of this particular talk. The other issue that isn't controllable particularly is the reflective nature of the subject. Obviously, a dark subject absorbs light. A light-colored subject reflects light. And this actually does come into play shooting human subjects when you shoot individuals of color. Number 33 with a white jersey is one of my son's teammates. Being African American is harder to expose than the young man he's blocking out there in the lane. Now if I change the exposure to get Xavier right, then many of the other subjects tend to be overexposed. So the reflective nature of the subject is challenging, and those who shoot weddings, particularly of African American people, find it more challenging photographically than shooting Caucasian. That just has to do with the reflective nature of the subject, and you may want to tweak your exposure up a little bit if you're shooting African Americans or other people of color. All right, how about the features that are controllable? Well, we talked about three main ones, so we'll go through those sequentially. The first controllable determinant of exposure is the shutter speed. Another term for that is the exposure time, which is really a more technical term that is proper. So just the amount of time that the shutter is open before it closes down again and stops the flow of light into the camera. Here is the technical definition. After you press that shutter release button, the shutter opens and then closes to whatever you've got it set. Obviously, the longer the shutter is open, the more light enters the camera. Usually, the shutter speed is fairly brief, well under one second, more commonly one one hundredth of a second or thereabouts. And because of this, on the camera, the number that you see is actually a reciprocal. So if you see 250 on a camera, for example, it typically means you're shooting at one two fiftieth of a second. Or if you see a 60, that means 1 60th of a second is the actual shutter speed. If you're going to handhold the camera, it's hard to do unless you have a shutter speed that's at least as fast as a 30th of a second or less. And the reason for that is that as you're holding the camera, you have some minor movements of your muscles, you breathe, your heart beats, and you move the camera and you start getting some blur. The longer focal length you have, the harder it is to hold the camera without that blur. So longer shutter speeds, like an eighth of a second up to several seconds, virtually always require a tripod or the equivalent of a tripod where you might just set the camera on a firm surface and take the shot. If you would like to freeze the action, something we like to do in sports photography, you like a fast shutter speed, in other words, a short exposure time. And typically that's one five hundredth of a second or even faster than that. On the other hand, slower shutter speeds or long exposure time can be useful for nature shots if you're shooting off a tripod and for special effects, such as purposeful blurring of a subject that's in motion. And I'll show you one of those here in a moment. Let's go back to the shots of the clock tower in Hudson. My very first photo was very underexposed, and that was shot at 1 250th of a second. And as I go from one shot to the next, the only thing that changes is the shutter speed. So my second shot was at 1 125th of a second. So in other words, the shutter was open twice as long as on that first exposure. Thereby, twice as much light got into the camera, making it better exposed than the first one, but still not good enough. We call this going up a stop, S-T-O-P, going up a stop. That refers to doubling the amount of light that gets to the sensor. And you can do that in a variety of ways. Here we're doing it by lengthening the amount of time the shutter is open. So let's go up another stop. Here is at a 60th of a second. I doubled the exposure time again. And we're starting to get a better exposure. Here's at a 30th of a second, another stop up. 
Still don't have any detail in the brick on the clock tower, at least not much of it. I'm showing you black and white on the left and color on the right here as well. Here's at a fifteenth of a second. And that's a pretty good exposure of the clock tower. And this is the one I showed you earlier that's right in the center. Here's at an eighth of a second. And the clock tower is very nicely exposed. The sky is a little blown out now. It's just pretty much all white. And because the shutter was open a longer period of time, you'll notice that the leaves there have got some motion artifact. Because over that eighth of a second, the little wind moved those leaves. And so they now become blurred on my photo. That may or may not bother you, depending on what effect you're looking for. Here's at a fourth of a second. Here's at a half of a second. And here's at a full second exposure. Obviously, way, way overexposed. If you saw this with your naked eye, you'd quickly grab your sunglasses. Let's go through these again, and this time focus on the actual histograms, since we touched on that earlier. Look how this histogram is cut off on the left end, and then as I go through the sequence, it becomes more balanced. That's a balanced histogram. And then as I go to the right end, now we're cut off on the right end. So again, histograms can help you know if your exposure is good. And ideally, to retain the detail in all parts of your photograph, you don't want to be cut off on either end. Let's look at some examples of shutter speeds used on a variety of photos. Here I was shooting a baseball game. My son is down there at second base. Threw over to the third baseman here who is just about to apply the tag. And you'll see how frozen everything is on this photograph. From the dust flying in the air to the players that just look frozen in time. This is typically a nice look for a sports photograph. And this was shot outdoors with plenty of light at one two thousandth of a second exposure time. So very fast shutter speed, which you can do when you've got a lot of ambient light. This is my youngest child playing softball and getting the bat on the ball. The ball was obviously moving, but here it looks frozen right to the bat there. And that's at a 1250th of a second. So very short exposure time. If we come a little bit closer to more typical ranges, was my son playing in the state golf tournament in Columbus at a 640th of a second. He's fairly frozen, although you see some motion of the golf club, and the ball looks like a long oval, and that's because that ball's moving at over 100 miles an hour. So even at a 640th of a second, the motion of the ball is a few inches, and so that does blur out. People typically like to shoot around a 500th of a second down to maybe a 50th of a second. Here's my youngest on the left there with one of her cousins. And that's a typical shutter speed for shooting people. I don't like to go much longer than a 50th of a second because you start to get blurring. Because not only do you begin to move, but your subjects also begin to move over that 50th or 30th or 15th of a second, whatever you're shooting at. Here's an example of a photograph I took at a 30th of a second of my friend Lee riding a bicycle. This photo is also in the sports photography talk. I took this picture by actually moving the camera as Lee was riding by so that he remains in reasonable focus, but the background is totally out of focus and in movement because over a 30th of a second, my camera moved an inch or two so this is a nice look if you want to depict some motion. Let's see Lee's left foot appears to be in motion. His wheels look like they're spinning. And so this is a way to purposely introduce some blurring to a photograph to give you depiction of motion. In contrast, if you keep your camera totally steady like I did on this shot, which is from a tripod, there's a thirteenth of a second. Now, shooting nature shots, you may shoot much longer exposure times than that, but if you have a moving object or a person in your photograph, then they're going to blur out. And here was a car moving probably no more than 30 miles an hour going down the street, but over that 13th of a second, the car moved a few feet, and thereby it becomes blurred on the photograph. You can go to even longer exposure times. Here's one of the firework shots I took a few years ago. And this is a four second exposure. You wouldn't actually see this with your naked eye because those plumes are burning out as they go 
radially out from where the explosion was, but it makes for a nice time exposure with all the colors showing so vividly. And then finally, here's a shot I took on a snowy day in Hudson, Ohio, of my house, showing a little flash onto the scene to show you the depth of the snow. But this is a 20-second exposure. Lamp lights are fairly blown out in terms of overexposure, but the rest of the scene is reasonably exposed. Now, it's very easy to mess up photographs with shutter speed problems. My son, when he first began playing competitive basketball, junior high level, uh, it was when I started taking uh, photographs with a digital SLR camera. But when I first started, I was getting shots like this. And perhaps if you're getting shots like this, you can relate to this. You'll see nothing seems to be in focus. That's because my camera is moving a little bit. I shot this at a 50th of a second, which is not nearly fast enough to freeze a sports photograph. And you'll see the ball in motion, but really a pretty crummy photograph and not very usable. A few years later, with some better equipment, I took this shot of my son putting up a jump shot over another number 22. And you'll notice good overall exposure. Everybody's frozen. No motion of the ball, no blurry arms. And this is because this was shot at 1 640th of a second. And Scott Kelby, who is kind of my mentor in digital photography, who has written several good books on digital photography, he recommends this being your default shutter speed for a shooting sport, 1 640th of a second. All right. The second major determinant of exposure that you can control with your camera is what is called aperture. Also is referred to by an F number or an F stop. What is aperture? Well, the aperture of a lens is simply the opening through which light travels on the way to the film or nowadays on the way to the sensor. The aperture of a camera is analogous to the pupil of the eye. If your pupil is dilated, like it would be on a dark day or out at night or in a movie theater, that's an open aperture. If it's constricted, like it would be in bright sunlight or if you shine a flashlight in someone's eyes, that's a closed aperture. And we have the same thing with lenses. Here's a head-on look at a lens. On the left, we've got a very open aperture. That's allows a lot of light in. On the right, we've got a little pinpoint opening through which light travels. That's considered a closed aperture. And obviously, a larger aperture allows more light into the camera than does a smaller aperture over the same time period. What controls the aperture? Well, there's a diaphragm system that has multiple components that's inside your lens. And these pieces close down to whatever level you've got programmed in for aperture and determine the size of the opening through which light travels. Here's with the diaphragm components almost all the way in, leaving a very small aperture there in the center of that photograph on the right. How do we denote the aperture? Well, we don't just do the pure diameter. And we'll deal with that in more detail in the presentation on lenses. But the aperture is typically denoted by an F number or F stop. And the F number is actually a ratio. Technically, the F number is the focal length of the lens divided by the actual diameter of the aperture. So if you think about this for a moment, if you have an aperture that has a large diameter, a large denominator in that equation, you're going to have a small F number. Conversely, if you have a tiny diameter, a little pinpoint diameter, you're going to have a high F number. So what does that look like in practical terms when you look at a lens? Well, here is a range on a particular lens that goes from an F of 2.8 to an F of 22. The F of 2.8 is as wide open as the aperture will go. F of 22 has a little pinpoint. And so that's a very closed aperture. 
What else does the aperture do? Well, not only does it determine how much light gets into the camera, basically, but also is a major determinant of the depth of field. There are some other determinants of that, such as the focal length of your lens and how close you are to your subject, which comes into play with macro photography. But the aperture size is really a big, big determinant of what we call the depth of field, and that's how much of your image is actually in focus. If you have a large aperture, analogous to a dilated pupil of your eye, you get a lot of light in, but you get a very narrow, a very shallow depth of field, maybe razor thin, in fact, what's actually in focus. And what's in front of your subject and what's behind your subject are going to be blurred out. Conversely, if you have a small aperture, a little pinpoint there, you're going to get good depth of field. Things in front of your subject and things behind your subject will all be in reasonably good focus. And this is, in fact, why people who are nearsighted will often squint, thereby bringing their eyelids down and closing down the size of their pupil, actually giving themselves a smaller aperture, which brings more of the scene into focus. So if you're a squinter, this is why you do it, to get more in focus on your retina. Having an understanding of the effects of different aperture settings is really one of the big things that gives a photographer creative control over the appearance of your photograph, and in particular how pleasing it is to the human eye. Let me give you an example of this. I went to Cleveland Botanical Gardens in the spring of 2012 and took these two shots of the same flower, and this is just taken a moment apart, but these are obviously two very different photographs. The one on the left, virtually everything is in focus, and this is because I've got an f of 16, a very pinpoint aperture. You see the flowers are in focus, the green leafage is in focus, the little cactus in the background, which is a few feet removed, is also in focus. However, on the right, where I've got an aperture f2, that's a very open aperture, giving me a very narrow, a very shallow depth of field. So the flowers are in focus, but pretty much everything else in the photograph is out of focus. Now this may be an effect that you like because it draws your eye to the flowers themselves and not to other parts of the scene. So I think it's a superior photograph to the one on the left. You'll notice though that they're the same overall exposure. So how is that accomplished if you shot one at an f of 16 and one at an f of 2? Here I'm showing the aperture and the shutter speed going from dark to light as I go from left to right here. And obviously at an f of 16, didn't let nearly as much light in as I did on the right side. So how were the overall exposures similar? Well, with the aperture of f16, this is actually a four-tenths of a second exposure, almost a half a second. Because the photograph on the right was actually six stops up in terms of light. I had to go six stops down in shutter speed to get the same overall exposure. The one on the right, the aperture of f2, I think was a shutter speed of 1 160th of a second or something thereabouts. So overall exposure the same, but two very different photographs. Now if you're into science and graphs, I'll just give you this. We'll look at this on a two-dimensional graph where shutter speed is on the vertical axis, going from dark in the bottom to light at the top, and aperture is on the horizontal axis, then going from dark to light. You'll see that any one of these little green dots will give you a proper exposure overall. We can go with an f of 16 with a very long shutter speed, or we can go at an f of 1.4 with a very fast shutter speed, but all of these will give about the same overall exposure. In other words, from the top left there, I'm just going to go one stop up in aperture and one stop down in shutter speed and keep the overall exposure the same. So anything falling below this line would be underexposed or too dark, and anything falling above the line would be overexposed or too bright. But anything on the line will give you a proper exposure. In fact, the two photos that I showed you in this sequence were the ones at f16 and f of 2. But let's go through the whole series of them and just see how things change as we go down this line. 
So here is the one you saw already at an f of 16, where everything in the scene is pretty much in focus. Here's at f11. Open the aperture a little bit and cut the shutter speed in half. Here's another stop up in terms of aperture and a stop down in terms of shutter speed. And you'll see what's beginning to happen. That cactus in the background is beginning to go out of focus. If you go to f of 5.6, even more out of focus in the background. At an f of 4, even more out of focus. And this is not a bad photograph. We get the greenery there still in reasonable focus. As I continue to go forward, however, at f2.8, f of 2, which is the one I showed you earlier, you'll see that now the green stalk is out of focus and only even a portion of the flowers are in focus. If I go to my most open aperture of 1.4, you'll see even parts of the flowers are in focus and other parts are out of focus. So let's go through this one more time and just take a look. I'll do this quickly as I go from f16, where everything's in focus, f11, f8, f5.6, f of 4, f of 2.8, f of 2, f of 1.4. So I want to give you an idea of what aperture does to depth of field in a photograph. Now how do we use this? Well, in portrait and sports photography, we typically like large apertures, which allow a lot of light to get in quickly and allow us to use a fast shutter speed, but it also places a subject in focus and the background out of focus. And this is really what you want with portraits like this, a shot of my brother and my father. The two of them are in good focus, but you'll see the trees in the background are out of focus. That's what we want for a portrait. Similarly, here's a nice sports shot taken at the University of Akron by my good friend Dr. Ted Schaub. You'll see that the player and the football are in very nice focus, but the coaches on the sideline and the fans are totally out of focus. So your attention is drawn to the player. And that's the type of shot you'll see in Sports Illustrated, where you have a very open aperture that gives you a shallow depth of field. Conversely, if you're shooting nature scenes, you typically use small apertures or high F numbers which allow most or all of the components of the photograph to be in focus. Here's a lovely shot taken in October in Ohio, which is our prettiest month when the leaves are turning. This is taken by Steve Jacobs, and he put his camera on a tripod, took a full tenth of a second exposure, but the f of 16, that's a very pinpoint aperture, but it lets everything in the scene be in focus from the water on the pond right in front of him to the trees in the distance and the sky as well. Everything in focus in a nature shot. Now it's easy to mess up aperture too and a lot of times I'll come up with a photograph like this and kick myself for using the wrong aperture. In the foreground here is a young lady who's in good focus and then we have my two daughters. My older daughter is a little bit out of focus. We call that soft soft and then my youngest daughter who's in the sweater there she's quite out of focus and the reason that not all three of them are in good focus is because I'm at f of 2.8 open aperture very shallow depth of field and in other words I messed up okay let's take a look again at the interplay between shutter speed and aperture by examining these two photographs these were taken at a place called Brandywine Falls which is about a 65 foot waterfall just a few minutes away from where I live. The overall exposure is the same on these photographs in which the waterfall is the focal point. You'll notice the photo on the left shows the water being very frozen in time. In addition you'll see that the leaves of the bushes in the foreground are very out of focus. So how is this photograph taken? Well, at a shutter speed of 1 250th of a second, which froze the water, and then at the aperture of f of 2.8, that gave me a very narrow or very shallow depth of field, thereby bringing the waterfall in focus, but the foreground very out of focus. In contrast, the photograph on the right, which is the one I prefer, shows a very silky smooth look to the waterfall. In addition, the foreground leaves are much more in focus. So how is this accomplished? 
Well, this was obviously taken off of a tripod because it was a full fifth of a second, far longer than you're able to handhold the camera and get a clear shot. But it was also taken at an aperture of f22, very pinpoint aperture, bringing virtually the entire scene in focus. So two very different photographs, very different effects. And again, I prefer the one on the right. But this is why you can't simply put your digital SLR camera on automatic and point and shoot and hope you get a great photograph. You have to really begin to get an idea of what effect you're trying to accomplish with a specific photograph. And when shooting water, most people prefer the second look where you have a long exposure time allowing the motion of the water to smooth it out and give the appearance that the water is in fact moving. All right, so these things we've covered, let's look at the final major determinant of exposure which you can control and that's something called ISO. Now what in the world is ISO? Well it stands for International Standardization Organization and it really is a term that's kind of a holdover from the film days. We talked about the speed or sensitivity of color negative film. It also went by the term ASA. If you were shooting landscapes, you'd shoot with slow film, ISO of 32, maybe up to 100. If you were shooting sports, you'd go with fast film, 800 to a 1600 ISO, or even faster, or in post-processing, push the film, as they used to say in the film days. And then general purpose photography, there's day-to-day -day stuff, shooting your kid's birthday party, you would go with an ISO of 200 to 400. ISO 200 was my workhorse ISO when I shot in film. The lower the ISO, the greater the resolution and clarity of the image and the better color saturation you get. At higher ISO, you've got a much better performance in low light settings such as indoor sports, but you sacrifice image quality and you got a lot of grain with your photographs. And so the old sports photographs of indoor sports in particular, like basketball, would be very grainy looking images. Now, digital cameras now have retained the same terminology to refer to the sensitivity of the image sensor. If the image sensor is very sensitive to light, that's a high ISO, good and low light, but you get a lot of noise. If the image sensor is not very sensitive to light, that correlates to a low ISO where you actually get better image quality, but you require either more light or longer exposure times to get the light into the camera to saturate that less sensitive sensor. Now, the big advantage of digital photography is you can change your ISO from shot to shot. In the film days, whatever was in your camera, that's what you got. So this is one of the great, great advantages of shooting digitally is the ability to change your ISO from shot to shot. Let's look at some different ISO settings. Most cameras will start with an ISO of 100 or 200 and then work their way up, typically up to 1600 or now some of the cameras are going up to many thousand, even over 100,000 ISO with some of the newer Nikons and Canon. Typical range though would be ISO of 200, here's 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400. And notice this is the exact same picture, but as you get up to 3200 and particularly 6400, you get this pixelation look. It just looks like a very noisy image, like you're looking at static on your TV after all the networks have gone offline. Shooting at the lowest ISO possible helps minimize the digital noise in your photos, and that's a good thing. If a high ISO setting is necessary, though, due to low light, you may just have to get by with that noisy image. And there is good software nowadays to decrease the amount of noise in an image. How does this relate to our shutter speed and aperture? Here I'm showing them as continuous variables from dark to light. Shutter speed, dark on the left end, light on the right end as you go to longer exposure times. Aperture, dark on the left end with a pinpoint aperture, light on the right end with a wide open aperture. And ISO is similar. At an ISO of 100, not a very sensitive sensor, but you get very fine quality there. And each one of these jumps is a full stop. At an ISO of 200, you get twice as much of an exposure as you would at an ISO of 100. And all the way up the spectrum, when you get up to ISOs of 3200 or 6400, you get into very grainy and noisy images.
Let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. Here are two shots of a hockey play that were taken less than a half second apart with two different cameras. On the left, we had a Nikon D60, which is an older and early generation Nikon digital SLR camera. On the right is a Nikon D300, which is a much more expensive and better camera. One thing that made the camera better was it had a more sensitive sensor. It had a, what's called a CMOS, CMOS, CMOS sensor, as opposed to a CCD, or charge coupling device sensor, that was on the D60. And in the Nikon world, the CMOS is a better sensor. The other thing about the Nikon D300 that was superior is that it has in-camera noise reduction when you shoot at high ISOs. That's a programmable feature. You'll notice a second difference here is the actual shutter speed. The shot on the left is a 1 1 60th of a second. Sounds fairly fast, but again for sports I said you like to go 1 640th or better. And you'll notice that the player in the blue jersey, his hockey stick is clearly out of focus on the left whereas it's pretty in focus on the right image. A third difference between the photos is the aperture setting. The photo on the left has an aperture of 5, whereas on the right, the aperture is all the way open at 1.6. What does this do? Well, it gives the image on the left a greater depth of field, but that's not particularly what you want for a shot like this. You can read the phone number of the ad on the sign in the background better on the image on the left than you can on the right, but that doesn't pertain particularly to the subject of the photo. And then finally, the ISO on the photo on the left is at 1600, which will give you more grain and more digital noise than the one on the right with an ISO of 800. Now this may not be apparent to you looking at these images at this resolution, but let me zoom in for you. And here's the difference. On the left you've got tremendous amount of digital noise making that image inferior to the one on the right. So this image on the right is really superior in four different ways. Better camera, in-camera noise reduction, a lower ISO, and actually also ran that through some software to further take some noise out of it. So shooting at a lower ISO will give you better image quality, but sometimes you have no choice but to shoot at a high ISO and have some noise in your image. So how does this relate to the other two programmable factors? If we go back to that graph of shutter speed and aperture and the line in yellow being a good exposure like we saw for the flower photos, what if I've got a lens say that only goes to an f of 3.5? And that's pretty typical for a lens you might get with your camera kit. Lenses that go down to f of 2 or f of 1.4 tend to be very expensive. And so your lens, 3.5, may be as open as you can get with your aperture. But say I'm shooting a sports shot and I want to go down at a 320th of a second or a 500th of a second. Then I'd be down there at that point. And obviously this would be a very underexposed image if I'm shooting down there, uh, normally speaking. Well, the yellow line that I originally showed here is at an ISO of 200, and I can get the proper exposure of the dot that I'm looking for by shooting at an ISO of 1000. So everything along that lower yellow line is actually a good exposure. I can shoot at faster shutter speeds or more closed apertures and still get a good exposure at an ISO of 1000. I'm going to sacrifice, though, image quality by losing some color saturation and introducing some digital noise into my photographs in the process. So let's summarize this by thinking back to my friend Doug and his house that has shutters that will close. The three major determinants that we've talked about here are shutter speed. That would be analogous to the amount of time that these shutters are open. The aperture, which would be the size of the window through which light enters and hits Doug's on the face and then finally the ISO would be analogous to the amount that the sunglasses cut the light. Very thick dark sunglasses would be a low ISO cutting a lot of light whereas if you were wearing just plain old glasses with virtually no light cutting ability that would be a high ISO. So just one way to look at this and there are other factors as well how far back he is from the window would correlate perhaps to the focal length if there were 
a darker screen in front of him that cut some light. That might be a filter on the end of the lens. You could use this construct to help you understand the various determinants of exposure by thinking about how much light would get to Doug's eyes based on these variety of factors. So to summarize, our three major controllable determinants of exposure are shutter speed or exposure time. The shorter your exposure, the less light you let in, the more you freeze the action, which is what you like in sports photography. The longer the exposure, the more you allow light in, and you may allow motion, like that one bicycle shot of Lee. The second major determinant is your aperture or your F number or F stop. The smaller your aperture or the higher the F number, you let less light in, but you get a much greater depth of field. More in your image is in focus. A large aperture or a low F number lets more light in, but gives you a shallow depth of field. And then finally, your ISO setting. The lower your ISO, the less sensitive your image sensor is to light, but the clearer your images are with greater color saturation. Shooting at a high ISO makes the sensor more sensitive to light, but gives you poorer image quality with some grain or digital noise in it. So understanding and managing these three controllable determinants of exposure is much like politics in that compromises may be necessary to achieve your goals. But this is what allows you to creative control over your camera to capture better photographs. So that's the bulk of this talk. Let me just touch on a few advanced techniques and we will get into this in more detail in the advanced exposure and autofocus talk. Let's just come up with a few scenarios that might challenge your exposure. For example, if you have too little ambient light or you've got a backlit subject, someone that you're shooting that is up against a very bright background, such as the bright sky, for example, how are you going to get a good overall exposure? Well, you might want to use flash to brighten up your subject so that it better matches the background. How about if you have too much ambient light to get the shot you want? So you want to shoot some waterfalls at a full second exposure so you get that silky look. But even with your aperture as close as it can be and your ISO as low as it can be, you still can't do it. Well, you may want to throw a neutral density filter to cut the light coming into your lens so that you can purposely get a longer shutter speed. So that's one way you could do that. How about if you've got your camera set at automatic or program mode, but the exposure you get just seems to be consistently off a little bit. Say your images just seem to be too dark as you look at them on your LED screen. Well, you might want to consider using something called the exposure compensation button. This is a button found on most digital SLR cameras, and even a lot of point and shoots will have this little button. It looks like a plus minus, and it allows you to bias the camera to intentionally overexpose it or underexpose it in stops. So say your image just looks too dark to you, go to your exposure compensation button and press that in and turn your dial and take it up 1.0. Then you'll be overexposing the image by one stop, which may give you just the exposure that you want. Getting back to the backlit subject or an underexposed subject due to bright sky, for example, you may want to change the way your camera meters things. On a typical Nikon digital SLR, you'll see a little dial that has these three selections. You can do matrix metering that meters the entire scene, or you can go to center weighting where you only pick your exposure based on the center section of the photograph or a spot meter. You put the spot right on your subject, and it will meter the exposure just for the subject and ignore the exposure for the rest of the scene, but it may allow you to get your subject in proper exposure. Another thing you can do is use this auto expose lock button, and that's where you would maybe shoot at the feet of your subject if there's a bright sun behind them. Press that button with your right thumb, and that locks the exposure that the camera is going to use, and then you recompose, pull the camera back up while holding that button, and shoot your image, and it will give you the exposure as though you were shooting at the subject's feet. And this can be a useful little trick if you've got a really bright sky and your subjects seem to be very dark. Just aim at their feet, press auto expose lock, and then holding that button, pull the camera back up and shoot the shot, and your subject will now be well exposed and the sky will be overexposed, but you don't care about that so much as having your subject properly exposed. Another thing you might want to consider if you're not getting good exposures is doing something called bracketing. 
This was much more commonly done in the film days when you really didn't have any feedback on what you were going to get. But here's an example of some shots I took inside a church of some stained glass window. And I didn't know how the camera was going to expose this. Here's set at three stops underexposed. Here's at two stops. Here's at one stop underexposed. Here's what the camera thought was a good exposure for this scene. And then here's overexposed by a stop, by two stops, and by three stops. I took seven photos in hopes that one of these photos would give me the proper exposure. One other feature on the newer cameras is something called D-lighting, or specifically active D-lighting. has to do with dynamic range of a photograph. So if you've got some bright brights and some dark darks, you're going to be in trouble trying to get the shot that you want. And on a lot of cameras, they have this feature called active D-lighting, which effectively compresses the dynamic range of the photograph. So if you think of a histogram, it just kind of pushes it in from each end to allow you not to go off the scale on each end. So this is a nice feature to have if you've got big dynamic range. Another thing you can do is something called HDR photography or high dynamic range photography. And this is, again, if you have bright brights or dark darks. I was shooting a local golf course called Brandywine Golf Course the other day. And this shot is one of several that I bracketed. And this one was pretty well exposed for the sky, but you'll see that the trees and the grass were underexposed. In contrast, if I properly expose for the grass and the trees, the sky is pretty well blown out. And HDR photography is a way to take two images or more images like this, put them together, and then let software come up with a good overall exposure of the entire scene. And in this particular case, produce this composite image, which gives a nice exposure of the sky, similar to the first shot, and of the remainder of the image, similar to the second shot. All right, so what have we covered? Well, we talked about exposure, what it is, and what a histogram is, how you might use that to assure that you're getting proper exposures as you shoot. And then we talked about the three major controllable determinants of exposure, being shutter speed or exposure time, being your aperture setting or your F number, and the ISO setting. Developing some fluency with these three settings will allow you to take photographs you want with the effects that you want and the look that you want, whether it's sports or nature or macro. All of photography, to become proficient at it, requires that you start to develop an understanding of these three and how you adjust them to get the shots that you want. And then finally, we just touched on some advanced techniques that we'll discuss in more detail in a subsequent talk. Okay, that's it for the Exposure Basics talk. I hope this has given you a better feel for the different factors that go into making up a proper exposure. Good luck with your shooting. Thanks for watching.